Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And Frank from Tested. So Frank, two years ago, you worked on Star Wars The Force Awakens with Phil Tippett. At Phil Tippett Studio. At Phil Tippett Studio. And that's an important thing because I was so jealous when you spent those months there. Every day you go into work and not only were you working on Star Wars, you got exposure to the whole history of Phil Tippett's movie making career. All the artwork, all the props, it's just, it was everywhere in the shop. And you saw things like Kane, Robocop, and even bins of artwork. Yeah, and in the uh, in the attic of Phil's house are all these boxes with this artwork that I never like got to look through or anything. But now they have all that stuff, a whole bunch of that stuff for auction. That's right. So we're here outside of Prop Store where they're working with Phil Tippett to auction off some of those pieces of art, some of the movie props they worked on. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna chat with Brandon Ellinger to take a look at that collection and say hi to Kane, say hi to some familiar faces. Yeah. Hey, Brandon. Norm, good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. It's nice to be back in your warehouse, and I see some familiar things. Yes. You have a lot of pieces from Phil Tippett Studio. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited to be working with Phil Tippett, putting together the Phil Tippett auction. It's running right now, and we've got some great stuff from all his films. We've got stuff from Star Wars, Jurassic Park, Robocop, Robocop 2, uh, Starship Troopers, all the fan favorites that Phil was involved in, and many of his smaller projects as well. It's a real mixture of, uh, you know, items representing his career in filmmaking. Yeah, whenever you guys have these big auctions, we seize the opportunity to come here to get up close with some of these props. And some of these are quite familiar because we've been to Phil Tippett's before. Studio. We've yeah. seen them before, but let's go talk about it because this is such a magnificent piece. It's Kane. Yeah, full-size Kane. Yeah, this was the one that they built one-to-one -one for the shots where they actually needed to interact with actors. Uh, so it's static. It doesn't do anything other than stand here and look amazing. Uh, but it is the the one-to-one -one puppet that they built and used on set, which is pretty darn cool. I chatted with Phil a couple years ago about this, and he talked about the puppeting process because Robocop jumps in the back, but they have the arms. The arms come off, and they 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 kind of articulate. Oh, that's fascinating. And yeah. uh, Robocop digs in the back and pulls out those compu old computer parts. To, yeah, to yeah, yeah. Kane. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, they didn't build the legs for this, though. It didn't need them, I guess. Yeah. Well, Just it, shoot waist up, right? Well, I remember Kane was designed so to be completely impractical as a robot. Right? Okay. It's so top heavy, his legs are, are not meant to hold up. And Wasn't it sort of based on King Kong? I remember some of the references they were calling it Kong on the production oh, paperwork. I'm not sure. But I think that was the inspiration, at least, was drawn out of King Kong. Well, it was definitely a stop sense. motion. Yeah. yeah stop yeah. motion robot. But again, this holds up in frame as a full size piece. Wow. But you have other pieces from Robo Robocop as well? So we just got a couple of pieces of it on display here. But we do, in the auction, have a complete Robocop costume from Robocop 2. Uh, it is screen match. This is the chest armor that you see when it gets hit with the taser. And you can see the marks on the chest here. Uh, we believe that the costume was from the original Robocop as well. We're not 100% on that. Uh, still doing some research. We'd like to confirm it for sure, but believed to be from the first movie, repainted and reused in the second film. Which is what I've always heard when talking to people at Tippett Studio. That's right, yeah. So you talk about doing research too. I mean, you have direct from the source, talking to Phil, talking to his team, yeah. where these props come from. But then you also have a team here that you guys are screen matching. We spend a lot of time. Check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of time going through old issues of Cinefix and just going through Blu-rays frame by frame and looking at things like the markings on the chest here where the taser hit it and saying, okay, you know what, I can see this scratch in exactly the same way and I can see these two paint specs here. So yeah, that is that exact piece in the shot for sure. And what strikes me about this piece is the color. Yes. Um, Robocop 2, I, you know, in my mind, he's blue and silver, but in person, he's a, he has a purple hue to him. Yeah, that very cool kind of pearlescent, uh, almost rainbowed finish to it, right? Mm -hmm. Very neat, very yeah. well done. Wow, you get the gloves, and it is a full suit? We have the full suit, yeah, as I say, we just have a couple of pieces set up on display here. The torso section is foam latex, it's very delicate, as old as it is, so uh, we didn't want to dress it on the mannequin, but you know, it is the full costume with all the armor. The helmet, I think, has the face attached for stunt sequences, so they would just put a latex face in there just to cover if a stunt actor was wearing it at some point. Um, but how great is that, you know, RoboCop costume? And I know that there are other RoboCop costumes out there in the collector field and collector's hands. I think most of them are probably later iterations like recast tour suits, possibly from the television show. I don't know if I've ever seen offered in the past a movie costume. So 
we're excited to have that one. And behind this stunt suit, you also have a matte painting. And before we start shooting, we're scrutinizing this. It's one of these things that you have photos of, or you can see them in books, but to see it in person, there's so much detail about the making of a matte painting that you don't notice. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you pointed out that it looks like San Francisco to you. Yeah, I see Sutro Tower right here. Yeah. And so that Look looks that. like they started off with like a photo of San Francisco at night with the freeway right there. But then they were just like drawn in buildings. And some of these buildings aren't even real buildings. They're yeah. just made for this, this matte painting. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I guess that's economical filmmaking for you. Why sit down and paint the whole thing if you can start with a photograph? Uh, and as you're saying, I mean, some of it you can tell is still the photographic elements, but some of it is very clearly drawn on as well. And then I noticed we have these cuts over here on the left-hand side, which I assume are to run some kind of light, some kind of motion, maybe simulate a freeway behind the artwork. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this goes along the freeway. But I, the nice thing about this one, too, is it's a matte painting on board. So some of the matte paintings we've seen in the past are on glass. Anything on glass, obviously, highly delicate, highly fragile, a little bit frightening if you're putting it on your wall in Southern California where we have lots of earthquakes. But a board map painting you can actually display without worrying about it too much. So that's kind of neat. It's a great piece of art. And speaking of art, you know, this is in frame in the movie, but there's also a lot of pre-production pieces. Phil did work on Star Wars. What do you guys got from Star Wars? Yeah, we have some good stuff from Star Wars. I mean, some of the real highlights of the auction, in my opinion, are the flat lots, the paperwork, the production ephemera, the photographs. Uh, Phil just had boxes of this stuff. He told me a story. He said, when we were looking through the materials for the auction, he said to me, every time I finished a movie, I took everything that was around and put it in a box. And these are those boxes. And we got to go through all those boxes and pull out the material and find the stuff for this auction. So... You know, in there we found things like Phil's original concept sketches for the hollow chest monsters from the original Star Wars. Yeah, from the Jarek, yeah. Um, and how cool is that? This is a character that they actually made and used in the film. You can see it's got Phil's label that he put on there at some point. And there are a few of these. You know, there were a number of pages of sketches, some of which were realized, built, actually used in the film, some of which were not built for the film and were just discarded concepts, but all kind of in the same design vein. I just really need to see. And then from Empire, you got Tauntauns. This one's labeled Tauntaun, but doesn't even look like a Tauntaun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's some concepts that he had for Tauntauns that are even further out than this. So I think the Tauntaun was one of the major things he was working on in the early days of Empire. And there are lots of sketches that he did in all kinds of different directions, you know. I love the fact that he took the time to sort of think about what the skeletal structure of the Tauntaun looks like which, you know, plays into his background, his interest in creatures and animals and all those types of things. But you can see why, as an animator, it would be important to you to understand how this character is built so you understand how the character should move. And uh, some of the stuff, which maybe we can take a look at, his, his notes on animating are fascinating because they're just so over the top. I mean, he studied every detail on as the character walks, is the back of it going up or down? Are the arms moving forward or backward? You know, what is the timing of the feet hitting the ground? All this stuff that you have to think about to get a convincing shot, which the audience isn't thinking about, but as the animator, he's got to sit there and work right. out. So. Both the imagined anatomy and also just all the proportions. It's like an yeah. the elevations of Tauntaun here yeah. from all your different profiles. For angles. the puppet, yeah. Wow. Again, you know, hand-drawn original by Phil Tippett, so... How cool is that? What's this guy here? This is a casting of the maquette. So I think mm -hmm. this is probably one of the first three-dimensional versions of the character that they built. And Phil had the original mold for the maquette. So this is a more recent casting that was done out of that mold. I think a couple of years ago they were doing castings for shop displays. Um, what a sculpt. You know, what a character. The Tauntaun, I think, is just one that uh, really just works in that universe. And then as we move along film history, maquettes were also then used to help animators and computer artists design yeah. the, the models. And so you have stuff from Starship Troopers. Yeah, we've got some great maquettes from Starship Troopers. Obviously, Phil was heavily involved in this project. Uh, Tippett Studio produced all the effect shots for the film, did all the animated bugs. And uh, the bugs were designed by Craig Hayes, uh, who was a longtime collaborator of Phil Tippett's. And they built these maquettes, I think, A, to have on set as a lighting reference or to show people involved, you know, this is what this thing's going to look like when they didn't have full versions around. Although I know ADI did build some practical bugs, but uh, also just as reference models for the animators as they're working to be able to pick it up and look at this thing, spin it around and see how it works. Is um, this warrior here static or I see pins here? Does it articulate You know, that's a good question. I have a feeling there's some motion in the legs. Um, but maybe not a huge amount. And then in addition to the warrior, we've got the flying hopper and the brain bug. Oh, the uh, brain bug. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. It's afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, yeah, all that detail, so much attention to detail for the artist painting this stuff on. Um, Starship Troopers is something he did after also famously Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park, now, yeah. Jurassic Park didn't have stop motion dinosaurs, but Phil Tippett famously worked on a lot of the pre-production. So That's right. Part of the production makes it to this auction. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as you're saying, Phil did the stop motion animatics, uh, which you can watch on YouTube. They're fascinating. They're awesome. And these are a couple of the models that played in those animatics. You know, these are the Jeeps that were terrorized by the T-Rex, flipped upside down, all that sort of thing. Uh, I think they're made from Tonka trucks. You know, they probably went down to Toys R Us and got some Tonka trucks. They cast some of the wheels and did foam latex wheels, I assume, so they could have the T-Rex chomp on it or something like that. Uh, I just love the way the logo of Jurassic Park is hand-painted on the side there, you know, which is all it needed to be for an animatic. Um, but those animatics obviously were crucial to Spielberg and the digital animators at ILM planning out the shots and figuring it all out. And then Phil was also supervising the digital animation. He had the uh, one job. Yeah, the one job, that's right. dinosaur supervisor. <laughs> and a famous meme that came out of it. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and you know, there's there's a huge amount of Jurassic Park production material in the sale. So you've got original storyboard binders from the time, and you can tell they're his working copies. You know, they've got little handwritten notes on them. Everything's been sorted out here by scene number. Uh, we've also got things like a dinosaur creature reference Bible here, which has got the different sketches for all the characters, which I think were done at Stan Winston Studios, uh, that just would have been available to to him as a reference as they move forward. Yeah, um, literally labeled each of the physical dinosaurs that were made and then the notes that went along with, you know, where this dinosaur, where the puppet was, where the full size ones was in in that day in production. Yeah. And where yeah. the approval process was and when yeah. it hadn't finished yet. It was so much fun to sit down and go through the boxes of this stuff because we just had, you know, three or four boxes that said Jurassic Park and they were just packed with stuff. So you're pulling things out and it's just like, what is this? You know, it's really walking through the history of the making of that movie and stuff like his script with the Amblin logo on the cover and his name in the corner. I mean, how cool is that? You know, just a little piece of movie history there. Yeah, we love getting up close with the physical props, but a lot of that informational like history in the binders, in so the bins. So much information there. Yeah, if you're a fan of those movies, you could sit down and spend hours with it, you know? And I did, to some extent, but uh, <laughs> well, we're we actually- Well, we don't have hours today, yeah. but would you mind sitting down and pulling some of that material? Yeah, up, yeah, you wanna see some hour? more of it? Yeah, I'd love to. Let's do it, let's take a look. All right. All right, Brandon, so what have you pulled from the archives and the collection? We pulled a few highlights, and there's a lot of highlights in this collection, so it's tough, but yeah, here's- <sighs> Some fun ones, and I've got a second pile here as well of just some of the really interesting oh. flat lots in this auction. Photographs, hand-drawn artwork, printed artwork, storyboards, just production ephemera, real histories of these films. And you've gone through, taking these out of the boxes, individually inventoried, cataloged, studied, yeah. everyone yeah. for the purpose of the auction? Yeah, I mean, that was the first step in the process was really just sorting the stuff. And, you know, Phil had it broken down by film, but then we had to go in and kind of say, okay, this fits well with this, this fits well with that, and put it all together. All right, let's take a look at some highlights. Yeah, absolutely. So this one is an original sketch. You may recognize this guy from the Cantina sequence, oh, the yeah. flat top alien, which I think was built as a hand puppet. Wow, so um, this is a hand-drawn sketch, piece of concept art with just studies around it. Just doodles, yeah, I mean, you can tell it's totally just a working sheet of paper. Uh, who knows what this all relates to down here. Just whatever they were thinking about working on at the workshop at the time, you know, 40 wow. years ago. Uh, here's one which Phil has labeled as a design preliminary for the chess set, so I don't think they made anything quite like that, although it certainly has the vibe, the aesthetic of the hollow chess monsters. Yeah, creatures in the front and back. Uh, yeah, some of it may be relating to Star Wars, some of it maybe not. Um, these guys sort of look like some of the, you know, chess, uh, chess pieces that were walking around on their hands. And then on the back, you've got a little doodle here of Greedo, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Which they didn't make here in the U.S. That was done by Stuart Freeborn's crew in the U.K., but obviously they had it around at some point and somebody was sketching it. So. I, lo I love that the aesthetic you can tell from the history of Phil's work, from Star Wars to Starship Troopers, even the stuff he's working on now with Mad God, has, has a lot of the same style. Yeah, right? def definitely. definitely. Uh, I mean, this would be another example of that, right? A very typic creature design mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. um, and this one says, what, Cantina not made. 76. Cantina with T-E-E-N-A. That's fine. We'll go yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think, I think that works. Wow. 
Uh, here, switch movies for a moment. So these are uh, hand-drawn concepts. I'm going to take these out, actually, because there's a few pages in here. These are hand-drawn concepts for Ed 209. Okay, um, yeah. And I believe these are by Phil as well. And you can tell they're kind of early because, you know, the character's got a, a different look here. It doesn't have that sort of cockpit-like front to it yet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's made notes on here like some sort of facial point, face cyclops. So he kind of had it as a single eye in the center. Right. Uh, Accessories like the radar tracking. But you can tell it with the feet very much mm. Ed 209 yeah. in that design. But from just from all different angles, like... I love because you're getting a look in his in his thought process and it was brainstorming. Whether, That's right. Like, yeah. Is it a bug face? What's the skull? skull? Yeah. yeah. And a lot of this stuff I don't think has ever been seen or published or anything. You know, so it's really being seen for the first time in this auction. And if you're a diehard Robocop fan, how neat to see something new after so many years. And that, there goes a more familiar Ed Two Hundred Nine. Yeah, right I there. think I think these are storyboards. You know, pencil outlines for storyboards. I don't know whether Phil would be the artist on these or. Or someone else. I know there was a dedicated storyboard artist on Robo 2 who did a lot of work. These might relate to that. Um, and just another sort of early loose concept there for Ed 209. Mm -hmm. Now with pieces like this, this real ephemera stuff where they never made it on screen, you, know, you may have seen, if you're lucky, some of the stuff in movie magazines or behind the scenes videos. Like, is it going back to Phil? Is it going back to his team? How do you find out the story behind this? And how do you go about your research? Uh, we certainly were asking questions of Phil, you know, also just getting out the Cinefix magazines and reading. Um, there's a lot of information that has been printed on some of these things in the past. Uh, this one is just a folder of printed copy artwork designs from Empire. You know, so these not hand-drawn, but still vintage copies from the time. I think there's 10 or 12 in there, different pieces of concept art relating to the walkers. Um, let's see what else we have here. This is another Cantina character. This is a sketch for one by Lane Liska that they didn't wind up using. Um, here's another one from Phil Tippett that they didn't wind up using. This guy is very obviously at the cantina because he's got the beer going. These are some sketches for Hammerhead. Um, and these are more like technical diagrams or working out the mechanics of it. But you can see here the side profile of Hammerhead. And then all these little diagrams are kind of relating to the the mechs for the yeah, eyes. Yeah, the tie bar mechanism to, to run the two eyeballs up at the top of the head. So from Empire, these are this is a stack of notes on animation. And there were so many handwritten notes about animating tauntauns, you know. Uh, head and neck, uh, large frames, same legs, just all this kind of stuff. Whereas he was working on the shots, he was making notes to himself on legal pads. And it's a real just history of, of animating the characters. And it shows you how much effort went into it, which I think is crazy. I mean, there must be 20 pages in there. And you can see more of it online, but there's there's so much thought that went into that stuff. Yeah, thoughts about as a as a move, like how to accent a, a movement of the foot or where the head turns. And, and I'm, I'm amazed I just saved all this stuff. Yeah, 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 it really saved everything. Uh, these are different build sheets for creatures on Return of the Jedi. So Phil headed the creature department for Return of the Jedi. You can see they've listed here who's doing what. Uh, you know, Phil, Dave Carson, uh, Eben Stromquist was one of the mm -hmm. mechanical guys. And they're, they're marking out the schedule here. You know, what days does it have to be done by? Phil at Desert. So this is when he's out in Buttercup Valley shooting. I've never seen any of that stuff before. Um, here's some photos that I would say were taken in the UK. Uh, of the actors or maybe doubles in costume that went over to Phil to be used in the creation of the miniature characters that they did to ride on the Tauntauns. Mm -hmm. Unpublished stuff I've never seen. Look at the stamp there, 1979 Black Falcon Limited, wow. which was one of the Lucasfilm companies for a time. Oh, it's taking all my energy not to just take this out <laughs> yeah. right now and go through There's every a single lot to picture. Look at. You can spend a lot of time on it. This is really fun too. These are uh, Tauntaun animation cycle sheets. So this is showing you that's his original note on it, but this is showing you the different phases of the movement, um, you know, and what it's going to look like in profile. You can tell there's, there's very subtle changes in the way the rider's legs are sitting on this. And, uh, you know, look down here at just the cycle of the, the Tauntaun's legs and all this stuff that he was trying to work out and study so that he could then match it with the physical model. And, you know, that's just one page. There's, there's six pages of those hand-drawn Tauntaun outlines in that lot. So... If you're a Tauntaun fan, there's a lot to sink your teeth into. Brandon, there's so much stuff here. We've just scratched the surface. Now, you guys have also taken the task of cataloging, photographing, scanning much of this ephemera. That's right, yeah. I mean, there's almost 500 lots in the auction. 
There are many photos of each lot. There's a lot of content to look through. If you're interested in bidding on something, if you're a fan of Phil's work, I would definitely encourage everyone to get online, check out the auction. It runs through October 21st, and there's a huge amount of interesting content in there that's never been seen before. Well, thank you for having us here. It's great just to see this stuff in person, scrutinize the details, but I'll be going home and checking out that lot. There's so much yeah, stuff. Do. You have stuff from Dragonheart, you got Kane's brain from Robocop 2, all of this stuff is part of the auction. And it could be yours. So check it out. The website is propstore.com. Propstore.com slash auction. And you can find more of our stuff on test.com. Until then, I'll see you next time.